Hello, my name is Anastasia Busis. I am your CBC Sports host. And today we are celebrating our latest installment of our CBC Sports Oral History Project with a deep dive into the success of Mr. Donovan Bailey in the 96 Olympics, of course, Atlanta, two-time Olympic champion, world record holder, ran 984, made Canadian history, and it's arguably uh, become the greatest moment in Canadian sporting history. So we have done so much work, developed this, presented the story with so many tidbits. Uh, we're retelling it in ways that you have never seen or heard. The link is in our comments. Please click on it to engage in our oral history project uh, or go to cbcsports.ca. And with no more waiting, I want to throw to the actual race. Of course, I know that we have all seen it probably a hundred times, but here is 101 times the greatest moment in Canadian sporting history with Mr. Donovan Bailey. There we have it. Thank you so much for joining me. I was uh, I was making a joke. How many times have you seen that? Well, um, today uh, that's my that's my second <laughs> that's that's my second time today. Um, <sighs> yeah, this is this is always um, it's always uh, amazing. Uh, you know, I, I guess not only myself. I guess I'm in the race and and I know the results. But a uh, man, I miss uh, Don Whitman so much. I mean, one of the most incredible, um, you know, play-by-play -play announcers uh, that this country has ever seen, uh, that the world's ever seen, actually. So, uh, you know, when I hear that, it, it almost like uh, like he lives on, and I remember some of the great shining moments that he, uh, the, well, I got to share with him. I guess I'm, he's talking about me doing my thing, and I get to listen to him uh, doing his thing. It almost raises the hair on your arms. Um Yes. Of course, you have seen it probably a hundred thousand times, but when you see it back and you allow yourself to feel uh, the emotions that were attached to that success, um, can you just walk me through that? I mean, when you think back to that hot Saturday evening in Atlanta, knowing what you accomplished, what does that make you feel? Well, there's a well. First of all, I'm gonna I'll speak to you about the athlete in me, um, although <clears throat> I'm not uh, I'm not. Competing. I'll talk first. I'll talk about the athlete in me because every time I see the race, I can only think about the horrible uh, mistakes that I made during the race, and I can only think about because my coach and I, Dan Papp, and I've had these conversations several times, and he said, "Oh my God, your first thirty was so horrible, and your last thirty was so horrible." So I probably think about the reoccurring uh, mistakes that I made every time I I I, I, I watch the race. However, I mean, you know, obviously we're at a point now, next year will be 25 years. So I've gotten to reflect about a lot of things. One, I can bring you back to the moment of the day itself where it was a hot afternoon. Uh, there was a lot of things going on in the world of sports that time. A bombing occurred that day. We didn't know if the games was going to continue. I'd fired my agent uh, a week before. Uh, about 10 days before that, uh, I had a torn adductor in France. Didn't know if I was going to compete or not. Uh, you know, you know. So there was, and and really, that's just there was a there's a big article in Sports Illustrated that I was being questioned about my opinion. Uh, so other than that, there was a big race going on. Uh, you know, so uh, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, that was an incredible day. I realized uh, the weight that I was carrying that afternoon. I knew it was, I knew it was, um, it wasn't just Canada. I mean, it, it was it was a cultural thing. 
Uh, and and ultimately, uh, at the Olympic Games in those times, it was, uh, you know, I represented the world. So it was the world against America. Yeah. Uh, you know, so so I clearly I'm very I'm happy, happily Canadian. But uh, but it was even a bigger picture than that. But um, again, it was it was an incredible afternoon. I knew that I was ready. I had been focused on that race alone the entire year. So my all of my training, all of my dedications, uh, commitments, you know, sleep schedule, food, therapy, every single thing was about that afternoon, that day, that race. I mean, it wasn't even about the semifinals. That was semifinals really was just a get me there race. Um, so I understood exactly what I needed to do uh, when I got in that race. And, and really, although I made a mistake at the start, a, a terrible mistake at the start, which I guess I'm the only one that sees, <laughs> or my coach, um, you know, I recognized that um, it was a good day. Um, I, I, I corrected my mistake in the time that I was allotted to me. Yeah. And um, and I got through and I broke the world record and, and became on that day the fastest man in history. But I mean, and you've said like the focus and all the preparation and, and of course you had an adductor, adductor injury, but did you ever think that you would have three false starts? I mean, Linford Christie, Addo Bolden, Linford Christie, false starts out. You're in the blocks for over 10 minutes for a race that's under 10 seconds. How did you keep your cool? Well, ultimately, one of the things about about Dan and myself and my training, my training crew in Texas is that we actually went through every single scenario. We actually went through false starts because one of the things that was happening uh, throughout the, the, the Diamond League season, which is professional track and field, for those who don't know, um, Otto was always trying to get out on me. Linford was always trying to get out of me. And one of the great things about what I did all year, because I had ran the indoor season, I would really be patient coming out of the blocks and, and, and knowing I could put together, uh, you know, the, the, the three facets of my race, I knew I was, my top speed was higher than all of theirs. Mm -hmm. So coming at the Olympic Games, I knew that guys were trying to, to get out. I mean, I know that. I mean, it's, there is, you know, there's a hundred and odd thousand people live watching you. Uh, you know, there's three, four, five billion people watching you around the world. You know, so I knew that everyone was, was going to try and get, uh, you know, try and uh, try and get whatever advantages they could on me, uh, but I really wasn't scared. And 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 one of the things that um, that actually occurred during the false start is I actually got a little bit more calmer. It was it was uh, you know it was just I became more relaxed. You know, because again, these were scenarios that we practiced. We practiced mm -hmm. you know headwind, rain, weather. Uh, you know, and false start was one of them uh, because. I've been used to that because these guys have been trying to do it all year. Uh, because, I mean, I, I guess they kind of knew that, um, you know, where I was or, uh, mentally and physically and psychologically. And and uh, it was, and, and for me, it was always my race to lose. So, and that was not going to happen at the Olympic Games. You've said that there was way more bravado back in the day, right? Like you see, <laughs> see guys now, they finish the race, they hug it out, they're all friends. And you're like, no, no, not in my day. So, what tension was there walking back to the blocks, knowing that you did that three times? I mean, as someone who had to race, I was a speed skater, of course, like that is the height of tension. Correct. I mean, here's the thing that, that I always talk about. One of, one of the reasons, I mean, I, as you know, I'm a huge, I play basketball, but I'm also a huge basketball fan. And I'm from the, 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 the age of, of, of Michael Jordan. And Michael Jordan was driving to the hoop every single day and someone was trying to take his head off and he was getting the ball and he was going to come back at you in 30 seconds again. Now, in track and field, it was the exact same thing. I mean, you, you, I mean if you think of track and field as a boxing match, but I was, I was fighting seven guys every day. That's really what it was. So you really had to get, to, you have to get into guys' heads, uh, you know, mentally, uh, you really, you mean some 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 guys got in each other's lanes. Uh, guys would start chirping. It's not like now. Now it's so nice. Like you kind of go, oh, okay, guys are guys are at the starting blocks, and everyone's like hugging it out and kissing and and all of that stuff. And 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 when we competed, it wasn't like that. When we competed, it was boxing. It was listen. You're trying to take my medal. You were trying to take. You, you're trying to take my victory 
you're trying to take the top of the podium. The top of the podium only has one place and it's for one person and that one person is me. So yeah, the tension was quite high. And uh, you know, I think at one point I said, I think I said to the field, relax guys, it's gonna be over in a minute. You know, so I, I, I saw, so yeah, I mean, and I'm very certain that pissed off a few people. I, I mean, I think it's, it still does actually uh, 25 years later. Um, but yeah, I think that it's, um, you know what? I think it's, uh, I, I think that it was, it was tense, uh, you know, but it's, it's all part of sport then. Now it's, now it's, now I see sports. It, it's so different, so different now. 85,000 people uh, sold out, of course, you said the weight of a nation, the weight of the world. Um, what did that atmosphere give to you? And even a look ahead kind of to Tokyo, we're playing with the idea of maybe having, you know, an Olympics without fans. How do you think that would affect the performance uh, of the 100 meter final that we'll see in, in less than a year? Well, first of all, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you're going to nod your head at this, but I'm going to go, can you imagine you competing without a fans, right? <laughs> right. Well, okay. With, with that being said, I was a speed skater, so sometimes there weren't many fans. But Correct. yeah, for the hundred meter climb, but I'm, I'm just, I'm, and and first of all, I'm going to talk about like the vortex in which fans give you that sixth man. You know, knowing that you have people and like your coach and and your training partners and your and your teammates. Uh, you know, and media and all those people that are there. I mean, it is it is a different level. I mean, I, like you know, I'm a very confident person because I don't think that you could be an athlete or you could be a person doing anything uh, that you plan on being successful that you that you cannot be confident about. I think it's I think it's a plus and it's a definite for every single human being in this world. But as a confident sprinter going in, knowing that the stands are filled, uh, like it's just another level. Knowing that there are you know, my family was there. My my friends all came from Canada. I mean, most of my friends drove from Canada, drove, flew, however tra mode of transportation. So they were all in the stands. You know, so I mean, the, the and and so the owners of the country and all of those things were amazing. I can't imagine what it's going to be like for these kids. I can't imagine Andre and Aaron and the relay team and all the other kids on the Canadian team. I can't imagine what it would be like uh, next year uh, in Tokyo if there are no fans. I mean, imagine this. Every single Olympics, there is at least 100,000 volunteers. We're not talking about fans, volunteers. So th those alone are it's such, it's such a good thing having that human connection. But the stands are so important. Uh, but I do recognize, uh, you know, obviously watching... Um, you know, boxing and the UFC and, and soccer and kind of how sports have evolved now that the event must continue. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, my God, it's so different watching, it's so different watching, uh, watching that live audience or having that live audience there because the 100 meters is essentially the epicenter of every, of, of, of every, sing, every four years, the world, the entire planet, stops to see who the fastest man or woman in the world is. And on every single newspaper, on, on every single media hub in the world, they, there is, there, there's coverage. So I can't imagine what that's going to be next year, but I'm sure we both be watching. Uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying to the guys, you know, any, anytime I talk to the fellas, make sure you prepare for every single thing because in Atlanta, I prepared for everything. And I got through it. So definitely prepare for not having fans there. Uh, but it's going to be different. It's going to be different. Fantastic insights. Donovan, I just have to say thank you so much for, for playing around with us and, and being such an integral part of us retelling your story. Again, go to cbcsports.ca to connect with our oral history project. We do a deep dive into all that he has achieved in 96 and, uh, we give a few backstories and, and some inside jokes and inside stories and just retell it in a way that I don't think has ever been told. So I appreciate your time, my good man, uh, you. and your insights. And uh, I'm right there with you. I'm excited to watch Tokyo, and I do think it'll be a little different, but, uh, you know, they're going to get through it. So I just appreciate everything you've done. And, um, again, playing around with our oral history project. Well, thank you, Anastasia, and continue doing good work. You too. Thank you so much, Donovan.
Cheers. All right. Take care. Have a good day. Thank you. You can go to cbcsports.ca once again to connect with our oral history project. Uh, we connect with we connected with Simon Whitfield last month. This month, of course, is the great Donovan Bailey. Our link is in the comments or go to cbcsports.ca. Cheers, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in.